If you're familiar with MLB pitcher Trevor Bauer, you might also be familiar with the four women who accused him of sexual assault starting in 2022. One was Lindsay Hill, who seems generally to have recently lost public favor for her claims when evidence contradictory to her claims came out. And now a second Bauer accuser has just been criminally indicted in Maricopa County, Arizona for allegedly defrauding Bauer and another man. According to what's been newly alleged here, she made up false claims of sexual assault in order to attempt to extort money from both of these alleged victims. And after looking into it, I do think she's kind of screwed. And I think this is now a second Bauer accuser about to be thoroughly discredited. Here's why. So like I said, if you're familiar with Trevor Bauer, you might know him as an ace pitcher in Major League Baseball, or you might know him as the ace pitcher who landed himself in the minor leagues after a total of four women came out with sexual abuse allegations against him. After he was suspended from the MLB as a result of an arbitration hearing over one of the claims, he was let go from the Los Angeles Dodgers and subsequently picked up by a team in Japan. He's currently playing for another team in Mexico and trying to make his way back to the major leagues again. Now, like I said before, the first accusation out of the four to come publicly came from Lindsay Hill. She filed a police report against him alleging sexual assault and then filed a petition for a domestic violence restraining order. Bauer then sued Hill for defamation and Hill countersued and eventually the two settled out of court with no money exchanged between them. She did walk away receiving some kind of payment. However, that appears to be from insurance that she had for herself. Essentially, in the end, everyone just agreed to put their knives down and walk away. But in the process, Bauer basically lost his whole career and at a time when he really was at the top of the industry. And the media has been covering it primarily from the perspective of the accusers. I did a video quite a while ago about this case and the settlement that resulted between Bauer and Hill, as well as the media blitz that Hill went on afterwards. A link to it is in the description below, but the short of it basically is after evidence was made public that included a selfie video that she took the morning after she says that he beat her in bed, many people in the court of public opinion really turned on Lindsay Hill and concluded that her claims were unconvincing. And I have to say that I am one of those people who is personally unconvinced of her allegations. But if you want to see more detailed analysis of my thoughts on that case, watch the video in the description below. Now that said, Hill still maintains her accusations publicly. And one argument that she has made in support is she points to the fact that three other women have also accused Bauer of similar acts of misconduct. But I will say that there are several problems with using other people's accusations and other people's cases as support for your case. First of all, it's a relevancy issue. These are all separate alleged encounters that other women have had with Bauer, and those would each be tried individually if brought to trial. Now, I understand that sometimes when people see a series of accusations like this, they'll see that as like, where there's smoke, there's fire. But on the flip side, when one person comes out with accusations against a person, it could also be that there are, say, sharks in the water that smell blood and want to take advantage. So in a situation like this, you have to ask, are these accusers highlighting the existence of a fire started by Bauer or are they simply sharks in the water that smell Bauer's blood? And aside from that, just from a logical perspective, keep in mind that you could also have one allegation actually be real and the other's be total frauds. In other words, the truth or accuracy of one claim does not prove the truth or accuracy of another. So turning back to Lindsay Hill and the use of other accusers as support for the idea that she herself was assaulted, if you use those other women's cases as support and they end up turning out to be lying liars who lied about their allegations, you end up losing some serious support for your arguments. And that at least appears to be what happened here with this second accuser. So. What's the story with her? According to reports, the second accuser is Darcy Adana Esimono. And apparently on March 19th, 2024, she was indicted by an Arizona grand jury on felony charges of fraudulent schemes and theft by extortion. And this ABC article further reads, Darcy Adana Esimono knowingly did obtain a benefit from Trevor Anthony Bauer by means of fraudulent pretenses, representation, promises, or material omissions, according to an indictment dated March 19th and filed Monday in the 
Superior Court of Arizona in Maricopa County. And it says that Simonu also knowingly did obtain or sought to obtain property or services by means of a threat to in the future expose a secret or an asserted fact in a social media message or in any other manner involving another individual, according to the indictment. That individual is not associated with Bauer, his attorney told ESPN. So in other words, these are two separate cases, but she basically did the same thing with both alleged victims. And now I looked this up on the Maricopa County Court website, and uh, yeah, here's the information for the charge. You can see the defendant here is Darcy Adana Simonu, and it says she's been charged with a white collar slash cyber crime. The victim in the case is represented by Ann Chapman, who interestingly enough, represents Trevor Bauer. Now, before we run away with these developments, I do want to point out that she has been indicted not yet tried, and certainly not convicted. And generally speaking, indictments are pretty easy to come by. The DA really has a very low bar to meet, and so the fact that she was successfully indicted doesn't necessarily mean that she will be successfully convicted. And remember, to successfully convict, the DA has to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt. That is a very high standard. So the question is, do they have enough evidence to actually convict her of these crimes? And with that, let's take a look at exactly what happened here and why this might actually be a pretty good case for fraud. According to Bauer's recent five-minute video talking about the criminal charges, he and Esimonu slept together once in 2020. And similar to what he says about Lindsay Hill, Bauer says Esimonu came on to him. As a side note, if there's anything for Bauer to have learned from all of these situations, uh, assuming that what he's saying is true, of course, Maybe it's that he should start taking on the role of pursuing women to date and to stay away from the kinds of women that are actually pursuing him. Not legal advice, I'm not a dating expert. This is totally unsolicited. Take it or leave it. <laughs> anyway, in December 2022, after Lindsay Hill went public with her allegations against Trevor Bauer, Esimonu filed a civil lawsuit against Bauer, making a number of allegations. And a week after she filed the civil suit, she reported the alleged assault to Scottsdale police. Specifically, she claimed in her civil claim that she had an unplanned pregnancy after Bauer violently sexually assaulted her in December 2020. Now, there were a number of claims in her complaint that I'm going to skip over so that we can keep this video relatively monetized if possible, but one of them was that he held a jagged steak knife to her throat and used her hair as rope to choke her. However, she later amended the complaint, alleging that Bauer instructed that she should not keep any records about what had occurred, including the pregnancy, and that they should keep it private between themselves. Now, according to Bauer in a recent video statement that he published to YouTube about these charges, before she even filed the civil suit, she privately came to him demanding $3.6 million to abort the alleged pregnancy. So in other words, according to Bauer, she made this claim first to him privately that she was pregnant with his child and said that she would abort if he paid $3.6 million. He refused, so she went ahead and filed a lawsuit in December 2022. Then in January 2023, Bauer's attorney, Ann Chapman, remember the one listed on the criminal case information page as representing the victim, reached out to the Scottsdale Police Department to file a criminal complaint against Esimonu. In it, Chapman accused Esimonu of theft by extortion, saying Esimonu had demanded financial compensation from her client for a pregnancy and abortion that was alleged to be false. Now, mind you, before Chapman went to the police with the extortion claims, Esimonu was actually interviewed by Scottsdale Police in connection with her criminal complaint against Bauer. And according to ESPN's reporting from police reports they obtained, she initially said she had a miscarriage, but later referred to it as an abortion. And when the detective questioned her as to which one she had, noting that these are two separate things, she responded, they're pretty much the same thing, and said she no longer wanted to talk about it. And then a month later, in a follow-up conversation with the same detective, Esimonu told the detective that she in fact didn't have an abortion, but miscarried just before going to a clinic located in another state. So, okay, a contradiction in a later statement to the police. But she further said that she did not visit any medical persons for any treatment, but rather saw her OBGYN in Scottsdale when she returned to Arizona. And on top of that, the detective added that the medical records she provided to the police did not indicate one way or another whether she was in fact pregnant. Okay, now I have some thoughts on this, but first I want to point out one more detail. 
In her amended civil complaint, Esimono apparently claimed that at one point, when she was about three months pregnant, Bauer became enraged that she went to the hospital because she was feeling like she wanted to harm herself over the things that had allegedly happened. And in his rage, she says that he slammed her onto a computer, breaking the screen. Okay, so with all of that said, let's go over a few things about pregnancy, miscarriage, and abortion. Now, this is obviously a super, super sensitive topic to talk about. And as someone who is currently almost five months pregnant herself and who took her sweet, sweet time to tell the internet about the fact that she's pregnant, I sure as hell would know and understand that. So let's proceed accordingly. So let's start with what we know about what Esimonu says about the alleged pregnancy. Now, Esimonu claims that that whole computer incident happened when she was three months pregnant. So we know that she at least claims that she got at least as far as three months into the pregnancy. She also claims that she knew about the pregnancy at this point. I point that out because there definitely are cases where some women simply don't know that they're pregnant until like, I don't know, like six months into the pregnancy. Maybe it's because they've been super busy with their work lives and they've had really mild pregnancy symptoms. Maybe they're currently breastfeeding a previous child and not expecting to even be able to get pregnant anytime soon. In other words, a number of things can explain why a woman might not be aware well into the pregnancy. But here, she says that she knew that she was pregnant and she said that she saw her OBGYN after this miscarriage. This means that she was at least three months pregnant when she was being treated by an OBGYN when the alleged miscarriage happened. These are important details to keep in mind. Now, first off, let's talk about prenatal care. When a woman takes an at-home pregnancy test and the test comes back positive, the first thing that she might do is well, first take a second pregnancy test most likely because what if that first one is lying? But after that, when reality sets in, the next immediate thing to do is to contact either the OBGYN that you're already seeing or your primary care doctor who refers you to an OBGYN. And the first thing, the absolute first thing that the OBGYN is going to do is confirm the pregnancy. Now, in my experience and based on my copious research before the first appointment, this is typical. What happens in that first appointment is a blood test and an ultrasound, and that's how ultimately it gets confirmed. So by the end of the very first appointment, the woman is usually walking away with a medical report from the OBGYN saying, yep, she's preg. And then this report might get turned over to insurance, who then approves all the prenatal care appointments moving forward. So in other words, from the very first appointment with the OBGYN, there is documentation of the pregnancy and a lot of it. Now, remember that in her amended complaint, Esimono alleged that Bauer instructed her not to keep any records of the pregnancy. But like I said, she did tell investigators that she was seeing an OBGYN. And to my mind, there is absolutely no way that any OBGYN is going to be like, okay, I'm not going to do what is professionally supposed to happen for your medical care, including confirming the pregnancy and keeping a record of your visits and all the reports from those visits. So even if Esimonu never received a copy of the medical report from her OBGYN, that does not mean that it didn't exist in her medical files. And in fact, I would be shocked if the doctor agreed not to keep those records. That to my mind, could very well be malpractice. And because Esimonu placed it squarely at issue in her civil claim and in the criminal complaint that she filed against Bauer, it is absolutely discoverable evidence despite the otherwise confidential nature of those kind of documents. So Bauer in the civil case and the police in the criminal case would be entitled to all of her medical records related to the pregnancy or alleged pregnancy or alleged abortion or alleged miscarriage from her prenatal care doctor. So that leads to the question, why was that never produced to the police when they asked for it when investigating on her behalf? And why does Bauer say that he has no documentation from SMONU from the civil suit confirming that she's pregnant? Now, I don't want to speculate, but I will say that she had every interest in producing it. And in my experience, it's not that hard to get a copy of those records from the doctor. And then again, as a litigator, when I have had an absolute banger of a case with super strong evidence to back up my client's claims, I absolutely love the discovery phase when I have every opportunity to give the other side my client's evidence, which, like I said, backs up their claims. And why is that, you might ask? Well, it's because it's the kind of evidence that the other side will look at and go, oh, crap. 
and then pick up the phone and start talking about settlements. So like I said, I don't know specifically why she didn't produce those documents, but the fact that she didn't produce it when asked, either in the civil case or the criminal case, when she had every interest to do so, is totally suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't, don't, don't be suspicious. 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 Now, one thing that I do want to make clear here is that there absolutely are plenty of cases where a woman has in fact been pregnant, but there are no medical records to show it. And that's because the vast majority of miscarriages typically happen at what's called the chemical pregnancy stage. That's the stage where you're still within the first five weeks and maybe the embryo forms and maybe even implants in the uterus, but then stops developing. And most OBGYNs will schedule that first appointment at the earliest like six weeks but maybe more like seven weeks. So it's entirely possible for a woman to have tested positive multiple times even with an at-home pregnancy test, then go to a doctor and be told that she's testing negative because she's had maybe a miscarriage in a chemical pregnancy. And when that happens, there are a lot of women who don't even realize that they were even pregnant to begin with. And on the inverse, there are those who might take an at-home test, test positive, and then later find out they're no longer testing positive. But with all of that said, as I pointed out earlier, that is not what's going on in this case. As I said, Esimonu alleged in her amended complaint that she got to at least three months of pregnancy, and she told the detective who was investigating her criminal claims that she was in fact seeing an OBGYN. So there absolutely should be medical records showing that she was at least at some point pregnant. And I see absolutely no reason why those wouldn't have been unavailable to her to produce when requested. Now, another thing that is interesting is the fact that she told investigators that a miscarriage and an abortion are pretty much the same thing. Now, one of the many things that I've learned about pregnancies over the last five-ish months is that the clinical term for miscarriage is spontaneous abortion. It might sound alarming because it has the word abortion in it, but it basically means that the pregnancy spontaneously aborted itself. So I wonder if like maybe she heard the clinical term for it and then confused the two. That sounds super weird, but I'm just trying to look at this from all possible angles. And otherwise, I kind of have a hard time thinking of any pregnant woman who actually think of a miscarriage or an abortion as the same thing, regardless of what your political perspective is on any of these subjects, by the way. And remember that she also said that after she miscarried, she went to the OBGYN. And again, she was at least three months pregnant at that point, if not more. And let me tell you, things absolutely can go wrong with a pregnancy and at any point in the pregnancy. For example, you can have a miscarriage at any point up to the 24th week, and that's just past the halfway point of the pregnancy. Then from 24 to four weeks, a stillbirth can happen at any point. Now, the likelihood of these things happening after like 12 weeks is super, super small, which is why most pregnant women and couples wait until at least 10 weeks to start telling people about the pregnancy. But these things do happen and they are horrible to go through when they do. And I will say that also from what I've learned, the more into the pregnancy that you get when a miscarriage happens, the more medical intervention is often required in light of that miscarriage. That's simply because the baby has grown to a certain size and all that tissue has to leave the mother's body somehow. So again, bringing this back to SMONU's claims, if she was at least three months or 12 weeks pregnant when she miscarried, her OBGYN, I would think, would be extremely interested in monitoring what happens during and after the miscarriage to make sure that there are no complications that arise. And if the alleged miscarriage happened at 14 weeks or later, that would be considered a late stage miscarriage and medical attention would become even more important. And again, doctors keep records, and all of that would be discoverable. So looking at the situation, I have to say that given her contradictions in her statements to the police and what she's claimed about her alleged pregnancy, things simply are not adding up. The math ain't mathin'. And there seems to be enough here to suggest that at the very least, she has some explaining to do. And a lot of it is going to come down to documents that she either can or can't provide. And if she can't produce these documents, this is absolutely a winning situation for Bauer because either she pleads not guilty and proceeds towards trial with all these inconsistencies and all of this plays out in public, 
or she pleads guilty to defrauding Bauer with her claims against him. Now, this, of course, doesn't speak to whether or not the final two accusers' claims are real, the two out of the four that we haven't talked about in this video. And I'm not going to opine on those since I don't have the information in front of me now. And remember that I said earlier in this video that you can have one accuser's allegations be real and another one be totally false. But looking at this overall situation, this would appear to be that as for the two allegations that have been made public through actual legal action, Bauer now seems to be two for two. The guy is batting a thousand, which is pretty damn good for a pitcher. But holy crap, I did not have criminal case against Bauer's accuser on my 2024 bingo card, but here we are. And those are my thoughts. What do you think? Do you agree or disagree with me on the conclusion that Esimonu's claims smell absolutely fishy? Is there something that you think that I may have missed or overlooked in this case? Also, if she pleads not guilty to these charges and this goes to trial and gets televised, how interested are you in joining me for live coverage of this trial? Let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it interesting or informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new here and you want to see more videos like this one, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next one.